Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Anna Zayaruznaya, who is assistant professor in the Department of Music at Yale University. Her research brings the history of musical forms and notation into dialogue with medieval literature, iconography, and the history of ideas. Her work has appeared in the leading journals of her field. Today, we'll talk with Professor Zaya Ruznaya about her book, The Monstrous New Art, Divided Forms in the Late Medieval Motet, for which she was awarded the Macmillan Center's Gaddis Smith International Book Prize. Welcome, Professor. Thank you, Marilyn. It's great to be here. Let's begin with an overview of your book. Please tell us about it. Well, it's a book about the motet, and the motet is it's a genre of song. It's actually the longest lived musical genre, probably. The earliest motets are from the 13th century. Bach was writing motets, and composers today are still writing motets. Um, but for me, when I think about the motet in the early 14th century, what I mean by that is a shortish song for three or four voices that has words, Okay. Uh, which is not very specific. Uh, but it's the words that are key here. So um, earlier today, my students, uh, my doctoral students, Will Watson and Pippa Ovenden got together with me and we actually recorded a motet that we'll play now so you can see a little more what I'm talking about. Okay, great. Let's take a look. So what you might hear there is that uh, each of us is singing a different set of words. Oh, okay. And they're all, so there's a lot of words going on. Um, and so the name of the genre, motet, comes actually from the French word for mo, uh, for word, which okay. is mo. Okay. Um, and uh, so my big research question for this book is, how uh, do the musical structures of motets relate to the words that are in them? Okay. Um, that is given this emphasis on words in the genre. Uh, what um, what are the musical sort of consequences of whatever a given motet might be about? And uh, especially the question is sort of sharpened by the fact that motets at this time are about some pretty strange things. Like when we think about what songs are about today, maybe they're about love or right. um, maybe they're, they're political songs. Uh, but this motet um, is about this sort of horse or like a half horse, half man, um, evil creature named Fauvel, whose name stands for um, a bunch of vices, flattery, avarice, um, villainy, changefulness, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he represents everything that's wrong with the world. And there's a book written about him uh, in 1310, 1314, uh, and then a manuscript made uh, of this book with lots of music in it, including this motet. Um, and so they're singing, the, the actual lowest voice is in the mouth of this kind of evil horse that is corrupting Christendom and it's corrupting France and um, and it's uh, and so and the the form of the piece um, is also in, in a certain um, kind of approximate way actually giving us a sense of the form of this evil horse monster thing and so okay. oh, a long time ago I started wondering uh, why do they write the motets about the things they write motets about. Mm -hmm. And how, what's the, given this emphasis on words and also an emphasis on um, the newest sort of musical developments um, in musical notation and music structure, uh, how do words and music relate here? Mm -hmm. So this motet that we just saw is in French. Are they often in French or are there other languages? Uh, the, in the repertory I study, they're either in French or in Latin or sometimes both at the same time. So one okay. of the voices might be in French and one might be in Latin. Okay, so you mentioned the lower voice was of the monster. What are the other two voices? Uh, in this case, they're of the, uh, the people who are living in this world 
um, that he is corrupting, and they're just they're doleful and they're sad because everything is wrong, everything mm -hmm. is bad. I mean, it's an interesting story um, for a lot of reasons. It feels very, very contemporary. Uh, they're complaining that everything is turned upside down and the good people are being punished and the mm -hmm. bad people are being rewarded and they just don't know which way to turn or mm -hmm. what to do with themselves. So it's, it's a social critique. I was going to say, it sounds very political to me. It is very political. Okay. Yeah, and so that's one of the functions. Uh, so starting from pieces like this, uh, I got into well, uh, I, I found other motets from this time that were about monsters or the monstrous or hybrid creatures that were part something and part mm -hmm. something else. And, uh, and it turns out that one of the functions of the monster and the monstrous in medieval uh, thought is uh, to do criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a sort of, it's a way to do, uh, to do criticism sort of viscerally, just kind of like if you think of caricature and the way that caricature brings out certain features um, to make people less human and, and, and more, mm -hmm. um, more sort of menacing or funny or whatever, uh, that the monstrous is used to highlight kind of everything that's wrong with the world um, and to put it into sharp relief. Okay, a couple things come to mind. I want to know, you look at specific composers, but in your um, talking about the, the kind of the political um, uh, color of the motet, it, I'm wondering if people wrote them with, uh, with imagery because they perhaps were afraid of saying, of coming out and speaking in their own voice. So using a monster, the image of a monster to really convey what they're feeling themselves without perhaps being persecuted. I mean, is that a possibility at all? Uh, I, I think so. Uh, the, if you criticize one person, then you're only criticizing one person. Mm -hmm. But if you criticize an allegory of the most, the filthiest, worst, most corrupt possible creature, mm -hmm. then everybody in their own mind goes to a particular place. Um, and so it, I think that criticism that's done in allegorical terms ends up being more powerful mm -hmm. because it can, um, it lashes out in multiple directions at once right. and ultimately has more staying power because here we are. And um, so the, the story of Favel feels very, very fresh right now. Um, mm -hmm. Favel is this, is, is, he's a yellow-haired horse, and he's a, just a horse, but, uh, but people uh, start, they raise him up to be a leader, mm -hmm. and they're petting him, and they're loving him, and, and, um, and, and he gets more kind of puffed up on their praise and decides that he's going to um, take over France. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and then a lot of the manuscript is basically using this story to, uh, to point at everything that's actually wrong and saying the clergy are corrupt and the rulers don't care and the rich just want to be richer at the expense mm -hmm. of the poor and all this stuff. And because it's a story about a horse and this fictional land that happens to also be Paris in the 13, uh, 1310s, um, but because it's, um, it's, it's a story, I think it actually has more staying power than mm -hmm. if it were just straight up, you know. Right, right. And what a universal yeah. theme too, really, which it really is. is interesting. It is. It's, yes. it's uh, in some ways comforting to see that somebody in the 13 teens thought we are, the world is really almost ending. I mean, everything, it couldn't be worse. It must be almost the apocalypse because uh, creatures that are so unsuited to be rulers are being put in the highest positions mm -hmm. of government. And we are really, it's the Antichrist must be at hand. And on the one hand, it's comforting to uh, know that it didn't end then and hopefully it's not gonna end now. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you think, God, haven't we been here before so right. many times? Exactly, yeah. So I'm interested to know how you um, became interested in this. What, what led you to write the book? Um, so actually, Fauvel, this, this weird horse, kind of was the beginning of it. Um, because actually, even when I was an undergrad, I was a junior, and I was studying. I was at Wesleyan, but I was studying abroad in Oxford. And in Oxford, you have, um, instead of uh, classes, you have tutors, and you sort of go through things a little bit more at your own pace. And a t particular tutor gave me a call number for this book to take out when I, I gave it to the librarian. And, um, and they gave me this giant book. I mean, it's probably this big, and it's, it's a facsimile, a photocopy of this manuscript that lives in Paris. And, and it was all about this, the, 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 the disastrous rise of this evil horse. And it, had, it was a hugely lavish manuscript, beautifully decorated pages. Um, and I thought, who are these people? Like, why are you putting so much creative energy 
um, and musical uh, creativity and interest into telling the story of this monstrous horse. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that then led me to start thinking about these motets and thinking about the ways they use the monstrous. And, and eventually, that, that kind of led to this book. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about the composers that you use in the book and, and kind of about your methodology. Uh, so the book is not composer-centered. In fact, when I started um, writing my dissertation, I decided I wasn't going to really think about composers at all, partly mm -hmm. because most of this music survives anonymously in the manuscripts. So okay. they just weren't in the habit of um, attributing pieces or, um, or putting composers' names in the margins in the way that you start to see by the end of the 15th century. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, several composers uh, do keep coming up. As I, as I continued my research, there was um, two especially. One, Guillaume de Machaut, um, and we know what he wrote because he, um, he collected big, uh, collected works, manuscripts of all his stuff, so we actually know exactly what he wrote. Um, and he is interested in the goddess Fortuna, who is a kind of monster because she's um, split down the center and half of her is like old and, 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 um, and, and uh, and scowling and, and miserable, and half of her is, is beautiful and young. And mm -hmm. So um, she's a kind of, of, of a vertically split monster, and Machaut writes a lot about her. But the other composer that uh, writes about a bigger variety of uh, deformed creatures and, and writes about them, a variety of what you might say deformed motets, so mm -hmm. he's using musical form in a particular way, um, is uh, somebody named Philippe de Vitry, and he's actually the subject of my next book. Okay. So how did you find all of these motets? I mean, how many are there? Could you quantify them? I mean, are there thousands or really not that many? Um, not that many, I guess. Uh, in the 14th century, if you're thinking about French motets that are kind of related and in this idiom and they share sources and they share composers, it's maybe 90 or 100 pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and of them, um, in this book, I probably uh, deal seriously with 10 or 15. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a small subset of the repertory. But they're very rich, partly mm -hmm. because you have, um, you know, two or three texts per piece, and then um, they, the bottom voice often is actually taken from Gregorian chant, from plain chant. Oh, interesting. So that gives you then another context in which to think, okay, well, this isn't just um, a piece of music; it's a piece of music that comes from somewhere. So, what um, knowledge does it bring with it into the piece? And the same for the upper voices; they may have quotations in them from songs, from um, classical literature. There's a mm -hmm. lot of Ovidian quotation and allusion. So it. They are very dense uh, texts and very mm -hmm. dense musical objects, so there's a lot to do with them. So I imagine you t you've translated the ones that you're using in your book into English? Uh, yes, there's a lot of translation involved, and there's also um, a sort of musical translation. Uh, the motets survive in notation that uh, is, is, in a lot of ways, like ours. Like, you would look at them and you say, okay, that's musical notation. But then the details of it get a little bit fuzzy, uh, so you have to learn how to read the older notation, mm -hmm. and then um, think about uh, translating it into a modern notation that your readers can follow. Uh, so there's both. There's um, editing and translation of texts from both French and Latin uh, into English, and then also translating of older music notations into newer music mm -hmm. notations. And then I imagine when, you're, when the reader is reading your book, they, have to, um, they must have to imagine how the song sounds, or do you provide a way for them to hear the music as well? Uh, so it was really important for me to provide a way for my readers to hear the music, uh, partly because I wanted this book to be not just for musicologists, and certainly not just for musicologists who think about music of the 14th century, but I wanted it to be comprehensible uh, to the kinds of readers uh, whom I'm reading and doing my research, art historians, uh, historians of um, intellectual culture, historians of of, of, of various medieval sort of types. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think all of the music examples um, are recorded and they are online and then can be listened to. Um, and that was through, um, through a, a various grants that I received to do that. And it's been, um, it, it's been generally well received, I think, and I'm really glad they're there because uh, we want to, since we, interdisciplinary work is so important right now, um, not only should we be reading in different disciplines, but it seems important to write then work that is accessible mm -hmm. uh, to those same broad disciplines, mm -hmm. hopefully without sacrificing um, the specificity of you know, the kinds of analysis sure, that I like sure. to do. I am interested to know, um, during the time period where these 
motets were being sung, did they did they have special singers sing them, or was it um, you know where people would go? Was it a performance, or you know did people sing these in their day to day lives kind of thing? It's a great question, and it's really hard to know exactly uh -huh. because we. Uh, we don't have the kinds of rich accounts that we would like to have. We have okay. offhand comments, like somebody saying, "Well, I, uh, you know, I, one time I was at a, at a, what did he call it, a, a, a small gathering of discerning people. So mm -hmm. essentially, a cocktail party, right? right. Uh, and and motets were performed. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think um, my my best guess and the best guess of people in my field is that these were sung as entertainment by. Uh, clerics, so sort of the the educated, um, the sort of the, the the nerd class, you know, like mm -hmm. the secretaries of kings and of bishops, and they themselves were clerics, but maybe not, at least often not deeply in the church. They weren't necessarily cloistered; they were sort of secular clerics. So that's interesting. So, did was it exclusively men who were singing these motets? Uh, we know that women sang in the 14th century. Uh -huh. um, they probably sang motets. It's um, Again, it's it's hard to know, but there's there's uh, enough um, evidence uh, of women singers, and some of them probably quite talented, mm -hmm. and certainly courtly songs. So motets are, they're kind of funny. They're not courtly. They're not really about love as much. Mm -hmm. They sometimes they can be, um, and they're also not exactly religious, though they can be. They occupy this strange category where they can be about just really many different things, and that also makes it hard to place them in a, in a cultural context because they're so different from each other. Okay, yeah, I was, I actually was going to ask, uh, were you able to, in reading the lyrics, um, correlate any of those lyrics to what was going on politically or culturally or uh, socially during that time period? Absolutely, so okay. some, uh, some motets are in praise of specific rulers, whether they be popes or kings, mm -hmm. and so then uh, that that's easy to say. Okay, well then maybe this was for the occasion of this uh, this pope's ordination, or uh, for this king's for a particular celebration, or something. Though even then, it's often hard to pinpoint exactly mm -hmm. which one. You sure. know, seven hundred years later. Um, but uh, sometimes they are in honor of saints, and then the saints will have been dead for hundreds of years or more. And then you have to ask yourself, to whom is this saint important now, and why? Mm -hmm. And it ultimately, you know, tends to be political. Um, in that way, um, the and then you know the more some motets are just really especially Vitry's motets tend to just be social critique, you mm -hmm. know, a critique against um, the groveling courtier. So the person at court who just uh, has no independence, they just toe the line. And wouldn't you rather be your own person? Wouldn't you rather think your own thoughts, even if it meant having less money and less mm -hmm. prestige? And that kind of a piece. Because of its universality, is actually impossible to place historically. Yeah, yeah. It but could be is from any time. it's fascinating though that people are having those thoughts, you know, so far, far back. So it is amazing, really. So yeah. your book kind of has a uh, brings a new perspective to medieval and Renaissance music. So why don't you talk a little bit about how your work is a little bit different uh, and a different approach from what um, is out there in terms of scholarly publications. Uh, well, my work builds on a lot of other work, and so it's uh, it's certainly uh, standing on the shoulders of, of giants mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I think the thing that uh, the, the sort of broadest questions I raise are questions about um, what song is and how we can think of it. Uh, and so, um, one of the things I do is is suggest that instead of thinking of um, of motets and other medieval songs as these sort of monumental floating things, the way we think of a Beethoven symphony. You know, um, Lydia Gurr, uh, who's a philosopher, has talked about the, the work concept that there's a museum of musical works somewhere in our minds, and that's where Beethoven's, um, Beethoven's symphonies live. And, um, whereas these motets, they seemed to change with the times. They were updated. Uh, they, they were actually going for a kind of immediate relevance, and they were much more concerned with what was going on right then. Um, they weren't trying to be immortal, but they also were not completely ephemeral. They um, they had a sort of cultural staying power. So I offer a creature concept of the medieval work in mm -hmm. my book that's sort of trying to say, well, here are motets that um, kind of embody the monsters that they are about, and what does that tell us? What does it give us if we think about a piece of music as a as a creature as opposed to as a as a as something um, that is 
like a like a building, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the other thing I do is I think broadly about the relationship between words and music. And so uh, we have words uh, to describe how music and words relate in later repertories, like in 16th century madrigals, um, so Italian songs from the 16th century. We often talk about text painting, which is when you get a word like up or skies, and you go up, the musical line goes up, or, um, or you th sing about the abyss, and you go down. And that's a very a local um, relationship between word and tone. Um, and that doesn't happen very much in medieval music. And so um, if you then look at medieval music um, and ask whether it does the kinds of things that later music does to relate word and tone, you see that it doesn't. Um, it doesn't do that because they're later things. And so my question was, well, what does it do? Um, and so I posit a, a, a broader relation between word and tone that's not on the level of the individual note in the word, but actually on the level of the piece of music and its broader message. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think about the ways in which medieval uh, intellectual traditions, uh, like analogy, uh, support that kind of relation. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, what would you like uh, the reader to take away from your book? I would like them to, uh, to know that the people who wrote these motets did so very carefully. Uh, did so very playfully, uh, but also very seriously, that they were thinking about the biggest issues of, of their day and, uh, and also the biggest uh, musical issues of their day, the new possibilities made available by developments in notation, uh, new formal possibilities, and they were constructing uh, works of art that, that put these things into, uh, it, this created encounters, I guess, between uh, between important things in life and important things in music. And so uh, it's worth our time looking at these with the kinds of detail uh, and the kinds of, of care that, uh, that really carefully constructed works of art command. Thank you so much for being here with us today. This has been fascinating. Thank you for having me. For more information about Professor Zaya Ruznaya and her work, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.